Hey, what's up? My name is Rodney Cooper. I'm the host of Locker Room Talk with Coop. I got another great guest that's coming in for you guys. I got my guy, my bro, Justin Coleman. He was a freshman at the University of Alabama when I was a senior. And coming out of high school in the class of 2014, he was the number one player in the state of Alabama. And he was 5A player of the year. Also, he did something that not too many people say they could do or have done. He three-peated at Winona High School. Not too many people say they can win one, but he won three state championships in a row in high school. And coming out of high school, he had many different offers, but he decided on playing for the University of Alabama. And now he's a GA, which is a grad assistant at the University of Arizona, striving to become a head coach. So I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with him. And guys, if you're enjoying these episodes as far as the things that we're putting out, make sure that you guys like, comment, and share this with somebody that you think will enjoy it. And also, hit that red button that's on the side that says subscribe for your boy if you're enjoying these episodes. And I hope you guys enjoy the show. So check it out. So I got my guy, Justin Coleman. My, I knew this guy since, man, since while I was in college at Bama, man, I remember when he, you know, came in and played pickup with us. He was a he was a young boy, and then uh, he was a freshman when I was a senior at college, man. But but I I definitely have a lot of respect for my guy and J Cole. Uh, welcome to the show, bro. Cool, man, my guy. I appreciate you and your time, man. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. So let's hop right into it, man. So like on every show I talk about, as far as the the three main things I want to harp on, as far as the as far as the people that's gonna be watching this, I want to entertain, inspire and inform the people. So going back as far as, you know, you being a kid from Birmingham, Alabama, you know, you three-peated at Winona. So talk a little bit about that as far as you being a kid from Birmingham, Alabama, up until the point you decided to uh, play for the University of Alabama. Uh, man, being a kid from uh, Birmingham, Alabama, man, it's uh, it's tough. It's, it's tough to come out of that community. It's tough to come out of that environment. Right. So and just being able to win three state championships in a row, not only changed my life, but my teammates. Right. You know, rest in peace to Ryan Wilson, man. He had opportunity to play at Mississippi State for football. Mm -hmm. But he just couldn't, you know, put the streets down and it kind of got to him at the end. Right. And, you know, with us, you know, playing ball, it's our only way out. Yeah. School wasn't the best thing for us. We all didn't like school. <laughs> so, yeah. it was playing basketball <laughs> yeah. the streets and, you know, basketball, unfortunately, kind of took us to the best part of our life. Mm. So as far as like, so take me back as far as like, who was like, did you fall in love? Like what age did you fall in love with the game? Man, well, well I'll probably say around seven, seven, mm -hmm. eight. Who put the ball in your hands yeah, or did you just fall right into it? Oh, uh, my grandparents did, man. Yeah. My granddad took a lot of time and just, you know, communicated me back and forth to the gym, spending time with me outside. Mm -hmm. And it kind of clicked when my parents kind of gave up on me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? My mom and my dad kind of told me they didn't want no part of me in my life. Mm. So I kind of used that to kind of push to be better at where I was at. Right. So you would say as far as like uh, your grandparents was the one as far as being that inspiration in your life to keep you on that straight path? Yeah, most definitely, man. My grandma used to make me sing in the choir. That was kind of one mm. of the worst things I had to I, do. I mean, I mean can, you, can you sing for the people right now or – or what? I don't think I got the table, dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so as far as you decide, like, just say as far as you know, commitment day, like, who was one of the guys that recruited you uh, coming out of high school at Belmont? Petway. Yeah. I think Petway recruited all of us. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> thanks, thanks. So I, I just don't want to go past as far as like everything that you accomplished in high school, bro. As far as you know, you being a top top fifty guy in the class, as far as all the different you know skills academy that you've been been through. So, walk me through that as far as like, you know, what AAU teams you played with, and you know how you position yourself to be able to, you know, be seen by these different uh, skills academies. Well, I used to play for this hometown team called uh, Birmingham Ice. Okay, we had a yeah, good yeah. team, man. We won a lot of tournaments. So my last year in high school. No, my junior year, I'm sorry. We yeah. go to Georgia. Okay. We play like this number, he was like number 10, 11 guy in the country, and number one point guard in the country. Mm -hmm. Named Ty Sam Fiendin. You might know him. Played at Auburn. 
Okay. Yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. he was at school at Columbia. I had a career high of 56. Okay. Okay, excuse my, my, bad, my bad. Hey, I had 56 too. That was my career high too. So we, yo, we, yeah, both, I know. Yeah, okay. You was a bucket though, dog. You was a bucket. <laughs> I can't lie. Yeah. You was a bucket in high school. I can't lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, and then from that game on, I just kind of blew up, man. In Georgia, I had Georgia Stars. I had Georgia Stampede at the time. Mm. So my last ship, hey, you out to play with Georgia Stars, EYBL. Yeah. And from that point on, man, I had a good showing on the circuit. Mm-hmm. I had a chance to go to the Kyrie camp, LeBron camp, KD. I played USA Global Games. So yeah. from that point on, man, I was open up to a new world. Right, right. And that's that's the main thing I, I constantly talk about as far as on each episode, as far as, you know, when parents come to me and ask me as far as, you know, what their kid need to do to be seen. And my thing is, is definitely get on these different, you know, AU teams to be able to get not only exposed to a, a different environment, but even though if your kid, the, the best kid in the environment, he need to, you know, go against these top guys in their class because that's where the coach is going to watch them play. And, you know, as far as with us, being from Alabama, you know, it's kind of like a, a football football state. So we got to go out and be, you know, we got to go out to these different counts, go out to these different tournaments and be seen by these coaches for sure. And that's a good point you made, man, because now that I'm a coach, I see the perspectives much different, you know? Right. Like if I'm a coach, right, I only have a certain amount of time that I can travel each year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I sent out like different recruiters, different uh, recruiting websites to go yeah. watch certain guys. Right. Because I can't be in one place at one time. Right. So if you're not on the EYBL circuit, Under Armour circuit, Adidas circuit, it's going to be hard for Sean Miller, Coach K, and right. those guys to see you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's always something to think about that, man. Like, even right. think about, like, right now, we had a lot of L.A. guys play at Kentucky and Duke. Yeah. But it never works out. You know, you have these guys transferring. So, if I can't see you on the circuit, I'm not going to recruit a kid from Alabama to come to Arizona. Right. Because it just never never works out. Never works out. Right. And it's not mm-hmm. convenient. And they know as far as a kid being from the South, they not go. It's very unlikely for them to travel that far, you know, being away from family like that, too. So, uh, Especially the age of 17 and 18. It's yeah, tough. That, that's tough. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. So, bro, I remember when, you know, like I was talking about as far as remember you from when we were playing pickup in college, you being a, man, little dude, man, used to come play pickup with us. So when you came and played pickup with us, you got old, bro. I'm like, man, who this who this little dude is, man? Then you wasn't backing down, talking trash, everything. Like, wanted all the smoke. <laughs> wanted all the smoke. So, So my thing is, like, I was like, that's the one thing I admired about you. Like, even though, like, the thing that stood out was more like, you know, hard over height. You know, even though you was, mm-hmm. you know, 5'10", you know, 5'10", 5'11", whatever, you know, might be 5'9". No, I was just joking. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, right, 5'10". But the thing is, you never back down when you played against, like, a 6'5 point guard. And more times than not, like, you got the best on. So, like, where did that come from as far as you having that, that, that heart and not being afraid of the moment? Just having that tenacity attitude, man. Yeah. I mean, you know, you you grew up playing against a lot of dudes in the hood. Facts. You have no choice but to go back at them. Right. Yeah. If not, you can't say your name on the list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is what it is. So just playing like that all my life, man, and it just never left me, man. Yeah. And that just kind of brings me to a moment my freshman year when it's all freshmen versus all seniors and pick up against y'all. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Bro, you guess, you know, bro, like, you guess, no, you guess all your freshmen, you got, you guess your whole freshman class <laughs> up, bro. Like, these, like you guess them up, and they not even about their life. <laughs> what Jeff was, Jeff was, but Jeff, was Jeff, was, Jeff, but you, you guess them up, bro. D. Mitch, Riley, I know me and Riley almost got into it one time, and, and then it got to that point, and Riley, like, Riley didn't want no smoke, no smoke. <laughs> after, after the first two days, Riley was like, guys, we should change teams. No, we not <laughs> right. Change teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Freshman against seniors. That's it. We try to take their minutes. Right. <laughs> and you used to say that. You used to say that on the court, bro. You used to say that all the time. So, so as far as with you, you know, uh, going from high school, uh, you know, three P that went on. What would you say was the like, like the biggest challenge going from high school to college? Because me and you both know, like, college is a whole different world. Man, it's, it's a tough world, man. Because the right. thing is, you don't know until you know. 
And you don't know how hard you have to practice every day. You don't right. know how hard you got to lift, conditioning. You got to right. change your eating habits. You got to yeah. go to tutoring, study hall. Yeah. You got to go to class. Right. Even though we didn't go to class every day, but that's something you got to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, uh, it's tough, man. You know, you can't play the one on one style you played in high school. A right. lot of everybody's playing team defense, they're playing pack line, they're right. pressure you nine and four feet. Right. And the guy you're going up against, he probably was top 30 in the country last year, too. Thanks. That's why I say, I say it's crazy because when you go to college, you realize you're like, dang, like everybody nice, everybody cold. Because the thing is, everybody was the best player on their team. So just like you were saying, as far as like in high school, like, when you get past your guy, like you seeing the help come, it's not as it, the, the lane doesn't close as quickly as it does when you get to the D one level. Like everybody's long pause, everybody, <laughs> everybody, you know, quick, everybody, you know, you know, doing their thing and can react very quickly, just like you can, like you can see the play before it happens. So it's like you pretty much almost seeing your twin to a sense. Like as far as like uh, you like dang, like everybody, like really, we almost like almost the same to a extent. What you what you say about that? Yeah, I agree, man. Uh, I think my first wake up call was uh, I was in practice and I tried yeah. to drive and you came out of nowhere and beat my shot in the glass. I said, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> it, it's I, different. Are you ain't duck it? You ain't duck it? I played below the rim. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, it's funny because I was saying, as far as, uh, man, here, like nobody know nobody knows and understands for our preseason condition with Coach Lou, bro. So, it's, so as far as with you, like what's your story that you can think of off the top of your head as far as your top two experiences with Coach Lou? Oh, I'm telling you, I got one right now. Devin Mitchell, for sure. No question. Yeah, right. So we're doing, uh, I guess it's 17 when you go from sideline to sideline. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. And I think you had to make like three in a row and Lou wouldn't give it in. Yeah. And this man, D. Mitch, on the first one. Didn't make it. <laughs> the the first one. one. The first one. <laughs> you know it's about to didn't get real. It, bro. So yeah. ran, oh, it's going to get real. So he ran the second one. He didn't make it. So you know D. Mitch had that little, you know, like he about to die. <laughs> yeah. And he was like, bro, you know, I got to ask him, bro. I can't do it. You know, I got to ask him, bro. bro. Yeah. Hey, he was, hey, he be leaning on that a lot, bro. I remember when we was doing the mile test. <laughs> And D Mitch, D Mitch had told me. He said he was coming around the last curve. He knew he wasn't going. He knew he wasn't going to make it. So he said when he crossed the line, he just fell in Coach Grant on. Said I got asked, but I can't breathe. I can't breathe. <laughs> I can't breathe. He said he knew that was the only way. He knew he, he wasn't going to run that mile again. Because <laughs> Lou was not playing, bro. Lou yeah. wasn't playing, boy. Yeah. So he was doing the asthma. What happened? Oh, man, he didn't make it, man. He was there for like 30 <laughs> minutes, man. So Lou said, all right, you got to come back tomorrow. So we go to the rec run. He still ain't make it. Yeah. Man, he ran that 17, bro, for like eight days in a row before he made it. <laughs> man, it was so funny, man. Hey, I know what he mean, but it, it, it's crazy. It gets real, bro. It's, like I tell people, I'm like, you really can't prepare for it. You just got to go through it. You just got to go through it and get that experience. Yeah. You just got to go through it, man. You can't prepare mentally for it, man. I don't care what shape you think you're in, but – you you realize you're not in that you're not in that good of a shape once you once you get in the preseason condition. But then it's kind of funny though because with Coach Miller, man, we didn't condition like that. Like we did like yeah. wind bikes, we did like a sand pit and stuff. Mm. We didn't do suicide sprints, seventeens. Yeah. So I mean, every coach got their own little different tactic. Right, right. So it just depends. So so like I was saying, as far as you know, definitely want to inspire and inform the people. So with you being you know, a GA at Arizona now, you know, striving to be, you know, a head coach one day. And um, that's the goal for sure. So what would you say would be the advice to like a, a young a young Justin Coleman as far as, you know, being in the certain environments you was in that's, you know, trying to make it to that D-Well level? You know, people say, you know, work hard, you know, get good grades. But like we understand that. But as, but as far as what would you say are like the actual steps that a kid need to take to be able to position themselves to be seen? you know, about body D1 coaches? Well, first, man, I would say, man, like, life is bigger than basketball. Facts, bro. Thank you. You know, like, they have to enjoy life in order to enjoy the game. Right. Because if you're trying to work hard, work hard, work hard, you're going to wear yourself out, man. Right. Especially if you're not working on the right things. Right. A lot of people don't work on the right thing. They just say, oh, I go to the gym, I shoot around, I got better. 
Right. Or, or I go to the gym. I might do a few drills and got better. Right. That's not getting better, man. So I say first, man, just be a great person. Mm, yeah. You know, above all, man, just be a genuine person. Uh, Work hard. Give it all you got every single day, man. Right. And knowing that one day is going to come where your opportunity is going to be there. Right. It might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. It might be two years down the line. Mm -hmm. For me, it took me four years to be what God wanted me to be. Facts. So I had to be patient. I had to pray, man. I had to work. And uh, I got to where God wanted me to be. Hey, man, just like we was talking about as far as, you know, off air, as far as, you know, our purpose. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that you said that, you know, it's bigger than basketball. Like it's, it's more than just basketball. So I know as far as, you know, a lot of people, they try to put us in this box as far as like only being a basketball player. But mm -hmm. and then we then we get so used to us, you know, people telling us that that we start putting our identity to basketball. We using basketball as a tool to be able to use that for our purpose, which is bigger than basketball, which is using our influence, using our, you know, platforms to be able to impact people in a different way outside of basketball. So I know I was listening to this one guy, man. He I can't remember the guy. He was a DN at Ohio State and uh, he was going to be the first pick. But they was asking him as far as, you know, who was the guy that like that you'd have met so far that like took you off your feet or like struck you, struck you off your feet or whatever. And he was like Denzel Washington. But Denzel Washington told him he was like, football is is going to be the the two that's going to lead you close to your purpose. He said, I don't think football is your purpose. Like it's something a lot bigger than that. And I and I truly believe that. And like we was talking about as, as far as off air is that our purpose is a lot bigger than basketball. But we do so much as far as we put so much time, so many hours, and we're not really thinking and processing as far as okay, look at the people I can impact along this journey as far as it, look at all these kids, all these people that's like following me, following my journey. Like I have a message that I need to share to the people, which is sharing our story, sharing everything that we've been through, turn our pain into our purpose. You feel me? So I, I'm really with you on that because I be trying to get people to understand that as far as with the game of basketball, all the principles that we learn, if we apply those same principles to whatever, whatever we want to do in life, you know, we can we can do whatever. We already got the blueprint. We already got the principles. We already got everything that we need. We already got all the tools that we need. It's just applying right. it to whatever game or situation that is outside of basketball that we want to do. So, yeah, I agree with that, man. You made a really yeah. good point, man. And uh, to even make that better, we have to use the back game of basketball for our benefit as well. Right. For sure. You know, Facts. think about how much money, how much money the university is making off our games. Right. Our performance, selling our jerseys. Right. So now for me, it's like, okay, well, I need to get a free PhD degree. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. You, you know, like I, I didn't been to school for seven years. I got a bachelor's. I haven't paid for a bachelor's. I haven't paid for And I'm four classes away from a PhD. Which so costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. <laughs> hundred thousand dollars to get a degree, man. You know what I'm right. saying? So it's like. Right. We have to also use basketball for our benefit. How can it, how many people can we meet? Right. How many mentors can we have? How many people can I be a mentor to? Right. You know, so that's one thing I wish I would have thought as my freshman year instead of going in like, I'm going in, I'm taking rookie minutes. I'm going, I'm becoming the first person in Bama to get drafted. Right. It didn't work out that way. It's crazy because the thing is, you know, as a kid, I know as far as, I can, I can only speak for myself, but as far as, you know, I didn't really have like that, that that mentor in my life. Like, yeah, I had people along my path that encouraged me, telling me to keep going, keep working hard, like put on for the city. But as far as somebody that, you know, was in the position as far as what I was trying to strive to, tr strive to get to, I didn't really have that. So like you were saying, as far as, you know, going into college with an actual plan, I didn't have that. I just like, I just said, I'm gonna get into business because I'm one of the top business schools. So I said, I'm gonna get into business, get into marketing or whatever. But I didn't really have no plan. And I feel like a lot of us like do that. And then once, you know, the ball stopped bouncing or once something happened in our life as far as on, you know, the basketball side and we can't play the game no more. Like we feel like we don't we don't really know what to do. We don't know where to go. And we're not using our info. We're not using the game of basketball to be able to put ourselves in position, to be able to go through like go through those different doors that, you know, the game of basketball, Alabama, Arizona whatever school guys go to, 
go like go to or whatever. We need to use that to our advantage at times, like because we put our blood, sweat, and tears into you know playing basketball, playing basketball for this different school. And like you said, they they generate so much money off of us as far as with you know ticket sales, all this. Like it was a guy that that just messaged me, uh, say like, hey, Coop, your jersey is on um, eBay. Uh, if I buy it, would you sign it for me? I didn't even know my jersey was being sold online, <laughs> which, which is crazy, bro. So the thing I don't understand is that as far as with, with college, they don't want us making money off our influence, off our name. But if we're going to school for business, why not go ahead and start practicing those principles as far as how to generate income off our influence? It don't make sense to me. It makes zero sense, man. And like speaking of business, man, I for the young athletes who want to go to college who are in college right now, college basketball is a business. Facts, <laughs> it is. If, if I'm the head, if I'm the head coach and I'm recruiting cool, and you come as a freshman and you can't perform, you gonna sit on the bench, right? If you're a senior and you can't perform, you gonna sit on the bench, right? You know, and that's one thing kids going to college thinking like, yeah, you tell me all this good stuff in recruiting. You're going to ride and die with me good or bad. That's never always true. It's not. And, bro, bro, even before college, it's still a business. AU basketball is a business. Like, they th- like we thinking that, oh, man, like, we're with this Nike team, with this Puma team, with this Jordan team, with this Adidas brand. Like, we think we just get free gear, but all they're doing is using us as a walking billboard to where, you know, everybody's seeing our gear and they understand the influence we have and it's just going to make more sales for that brand. And on top of that, like, they're banking off of, you know, just say if a few of these kids go to lead, we done took care of them since they was at the age of, what, 15? Like, 13, 15, moving forward, that we done took care of them all this time that they're going to go with our brand, you know, once they get drafted. So it's all a business, bro. <laughs> It's all a business, man. Yeah. And that's one thing I wish I would have knew, man, especially going to Bama, man. Like, being a recruiter, they tell you the, the, all the things you want to hear. Yeah, right. And when you get there, it's never the case. So now you feel you lonely. You feel left alone. You feel betrayed. Yeah. Right. You don't have any trust. Yeah. The season is going by fast. Right. Next thing you know, you look up, you're a junior. Still ain't got no better. Numbers still the same. Right. So as an athlete, man, you got to focus on your development. What can you get out of this deal? Right. Like, because it's always been a deal made. Whether you know it or not, <laughs> it's a deal being made. <laughs> it's a deal being made every time, man. But uh, so what would you say as far as, you know, just say for the parents out there that's going to be watching, and especially with you, you know, being a coach now, you know, striving to be a head coach, what advice would you give to a parent that has a kid that, you know, they're good enough. They have the opportunity to be able to, you know, go to the D1 level. They got, like, all these different offers and stuff like that. What advice would you give to the parent to be able to, you know, have the information to understand that, you know, their kid is in a business. Like, they need to run that as a business. But as far as the kid, they just need to have fun. But they need to also understand it as a business. But as far as the parent, they need to actually, you know, run it like a business. I agree. Uh, Coop, that's a really good question, man. And- yeah. I think that's the problem with Alabama basketball. Mm-hmm. We have to find a better way to educate the parents. Right. And the parents have to invest in their kids. Right. Like, even sometimes when I was at home training other kids, the parents would just come and drop their kids off. Yeah. You don't know what your kid is struggling with. Right. So you don't know what you're paying for. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, all right, well, I have a parent just sitting there on his phone, like, hey, come help rebound. You want your kid to be able to shoot the ball? Like, it can't be one person rebounding or running after rebounds for your kid. At all. Right. You need to be you getting know, reps. Like, up. you can't watch. <laughs> yeah, like, you can try and get reps up. Like, you can't sit there and watch your kid. You can't sit there and just drop your kid off. You have to understand what your kid is good at and what your kid is bad at. Right. So, when you say, all right, cool, I want you to train my kid, my kid need to get better at one, two, step threes. He got to be able to shoot the ball off the move. Right. This is what he can do. Parents don't do that. You know, they have to be able to invest more than their money. Right. If they want to see their kid at a higher division one level. And then on top of that, even if they don't really, like, if they don't really know as far as, you know, what their kid need to work on, like, they can see as far as if he's weak with their left hand. Like you were saying, he's weak on the, 
you know, pull up jumper. He's weak off, you know, doing moves, getting to the basket. He's weak on, you know, playing through contact. Like, you can see that. So if you just, you know, tell us as far as, you know, what they need to work on, we can be able to go ahead and, and, and start dipping those things in the butt as far as, you know, attacking those weaknesses and, and moving forward because we have to start from, you know, ground zero and don't really know, you know, anything about the kid, then, you know, we kind of, we kind of like not move the process forward. Feel me? Yeah. And they expect the kids to come out and score 25 in two weeks. Like, right. <laughs> exactly. You know? It don't. It don't. It don't work that way. Yeah. And now that everybody wants to be a trainer, we got too many trainers, man. Right. Like this, this parents complaining me the other day, like, yeah, I didn't spend over 2,500 with this guy. My kid is not getting better. So my question is, what is that trainer doing? Right. What is well, he accomplishing? Watching him shoot free throws. He's just doing cone drills. That, that, a cone and a, a real life defender are two different things. Two different things, bro. You know, like, can you read a bar screen? Do you understand the bar screen? Do you understand the use of a punk fade? Do you understand the move of this move, that move? Like, and that parent can't answer my question. So it's like, I can't feel bad for you wasting twenty five hundred dollars, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and then on top of that, like as far as the parent, they need to do like a, 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 they need to do research on these trainers as far as seeing what exactly these trainers have done. Because I mean, it don't make sense to pay somebody that amount of money, and then you don't like they haven't played at the levels that your kid is trying to get to. It don't make sense. Like who has that trainer put in the league? Who has that trainer put in college? Right. What offers did that trainer pertain for these players? You just right. can't say, oh, well, this guy, he reached out to me and he want to train for my son and he charged $50 an hour. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know? It's yeah. crazy. It's crazy, bro. So so let's fast forward a little bit as far as, you know, talk a little bit about as far as a couple of, like, memorable games you done had at Bama. Because I, I know the one I was in, I was in Maine with the Boston Celtics G League team. And I, I know you was playing – was at the BJCC, right? Mm-hmm. It was a home time. It was it was a home time game. I knew the whole the whole crib was there. <laughs> I, I can all imagine how many tickets you need to get, but you got off that game. Wait, who y'all was playing? Y'all was playing Oregon. We was playing Oregon. That yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I I know you was gonna get off that game. I seen like the different the different vibe that game, so I knew it meant a lot. So so talk about a couple of memorable games and and also talk about that game too. Uh, well, since you brought it up, let's talk about the BJCC game, man. It was kind of mm-hmm. a norm to me because we won three state championships in the same gym. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was back home. Uh, over, I knew. I mean, uh, I knew Oregon ran this style of play, fast style of play. Right. Which is my style of play to get up and down. Yeah. And you know how it is when you get the first, second shot. Oh yeah. It's it's a good day. It's a good. It's a great day. <laughs> it's a great day. Yeah. So that kind of fell in my hands. But, you know, the one that's the most memorable one was my my first game as a college athlete at Bama, man. And yeah. I, I struggled. I struggled real bad. Mm-hmm. And I think that opened my eyes to I wasn't the good player as I thought I was. Right. You know, I think after that day I cried. I told my grandma I wanted to quit. I wanted to yeah. go home because I thought it was going to be a lot easier. Right. But it wasn't. Yeah. So I had a choice to either let it break me or grind to see better days. Hey, so. bro. And, bro, I really I really feel like, uh, especially with your story, you know, the stuff you've been through, and then me as well as far as the stuff I've been through, bro, I feel like, you know, we really have a lot, you know, a lot to share to the people. Because I know as far as mm-hmm. with me, man, just to, just to, you know, share some stuff with the people. As far as, like, when I was overseas, uh, like, I was – Playing at the top of my game, then like my agent sent sent me this contract. It's gonna be one of the biggest contracts that it was, it was gonna pretty much put me in a position to where like I'm I'm good, like I can take care of the family. So mm-hmm. my agent told me, man, it was a, it was a GM from the Philippines. My agent told me he was like, man, just keep doing what you're doing to stay healthy. Two weeks later, I injured my wrist, tore two ligaments in my wrist in my left hand, and I'm left handed. So I had dunked on the guy's body, hit me. I tried to brace my fall. Messed my wrist, so it took me a year to get back right. The eight, I mean, the um, the Philippines team ended up taking the contract. Now I went through like a dark space, bro. I went through like depression. I was like, I was smiling on the outside, but really hurt hurt on the inside. And pe- like I'm the type, of, like I was the person that everybody was coming to for advice, but I really didn't have nobody to, you know, go to for advice. So I was trying to be this strong dude, 
And then I really never shared this story to nobody. I never really expressed myself. And you know, as far as us as men, like we, we try to take on everything as far as trying to be that strong man for the family and for everybody else. But it really hurting us at the end of the day. We don't find somebody to open up to and, and express those feelings to. Because we think when we express our feelings, we think that, you know, we soft and, you know, we acting feminine and all that. But but now, like, we really do need to, to need to open up to somebody when it when the energies are aligned and it's organic and it's coming off like comfortable. Like, I feel like we really do need to, you know, need to open up and, and share these stories. Because once I started sharing it more, I started breaking away from that from that time that happened in my life. And I know you was talking about as far as some of the things that you'd have been through. You always say that those are some of the best things that happened in your life. I feel like that moment was when my real process started, like started as far as me getting, you know, closer as far as in my in my faith, close to spirituality, spiritual wise, you know, being able to, you know, always see the positive, positive side of things, you know, perspective. I know Ike Johnson he always talk about pers- perspective drives performance every day of the week. So I'm always trying to see like what can I learn learn from this situation when you know, certain things are being thrown at me. And people always come to me and be like, man, Coop, you so positive. I like, nah, I had to, you don't know the things I've been through. Like I had to, I had to learn this. I had to groom and, and build on this because I used to be the negative person. I used to be my own worst critic. I still am to a certain extent, but at the same time, I'm always putting it in perspective. Yeah, that's a good point, man. Uh, we all hit, you know, rock bottom most times. We got to right. figure out how to get away from it. Right. You know, and you have an cr- incredible story to even tell, man. Even starting out of them, right? Just the perseverance you had to stay there for four years, right? Yeah, right. Knowing the talent you had, knowing the capabilities you could have did, you know, sacrificing your dream for the NBA for something yeah. better, right? I tell people all the time, man. Like Coop had a great skill, like can pass, can shoot, can move, can dribble, right? Can play the three, can play the four. Yeah, like a lot of people can't do that, man. Right. So. I think you have a really great story to share, man. And then, bro, we both do, bro. We both have, like, similar, like, upbringings as far as with me. Well, I went to the game. Like, I had I had DMG when I seen <laughs> when Nona play uh, <laughs> J.R. I like, oh, yeah, this the hood right here. Uh, this, I, said, <laughs> this, I said, yeah, this the hood right here. But, That's the hood right there. Yeah, but as far as, like, a lot of people that I talk to now, when I tell them I'm from Hershberg, Alabama, they say, where? And I wear that on my chest because I take pride in that because the thing is, it's 500 people in our town, bro. Five, well, 550, you know, and I still think. Pop signs and one Popeyes. Yeah, right. We don't got that. We don't got a Popeyes. <laughs> hey, hey, we got some chicken at a gas station, though. We got one gas station. We got some chicken. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, bro, the thing is, like, one of my drives, one of my, like, the thing that motivates me as far as to show the kids, I came from the same type of environment that you came from. And look at the type of things I was able to accomplish, and I'm still not done yet. And yeah, as far as the kids that you know don't have the resources, like y'all must show empathy, but at the same time, like we're not going to use that as, a, as an excuse. Like it's always a way. Like, and it don't have to necessarily be basketball, rapping. It can be anything. You can be, you can be an artist. You can be a, a lawyer. You can be a coach. You can be whatever you want to be. But the thing is, like, once you figure out what that is, once you figure out something that you love. Let's put a goal out there and start reverse engineering as far as what we need to do to get to that goal. Yeah, I agree. Everything you want to be the best at takes hard work, man. Facts. No yeah. matter what rocks you want, you want to be a basketball player, NBA coach, real estate agent. Right. It takes hard work, man, to be the best. It do. And people don't understand, like, the work you got to put in, especially now with social media. They see all these, you know, sparkling balls going everywhere as far as, like, look, hey, I made a million dollars in two days. Like, that's not reality. It don't work like that. It don't work like that, man. <laughs> At all. Like I tell my guys all the time, man, it's 60 picks in a draft. Right. You know, 17 is lottery, which mostly is freshmen and sophomores. So if you got 17 picks, you got at least 20 of them being international. Right. So that only leaves you with really 20 American picks. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then only, and then probably only five of them go play. And only five of them is going to play. You know, like I, I told Nico May, he's my best friend. I love that kid to death, man. I told him the same thing. I said, bro, like, you're averaging 13 and four. Yeah. Like, you got some guys out here who fifth year seniors who averaging 26 and 27. Like, they're yeah. going to be at your head on top. Right. Right. <laughs> so if you don't change your mentality, bro, you ain't going to make it. 
And then, and you know, luckily yeah. he signed a two way, and he's with the the Warriors right now. So they just don't know. Man. Right. It's, a do- it's a doggy world once you get into that pro world because once they see blood, they coming. They coming. I've seen plenty. Oh, time, sure. I've seen plenty of times three on three half court. Like they getting bucket after bucket after bucket, and they keep going at you until you, like if you can't guard, it's a wrap. <laughs> It is a rap, and I told him that, like, he couldn't guard me in practice. I'm like, what you think John Morant can do to me? What right. you think Russell Westbrook and Damian Lillard? I said, I'm a GA. Yeah. Right. You talk about playing the NBA. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a different world, man. It's a different yeah. world. It is. It is. So, so let's talk about as far as, you know, let's give the fans, you know, the people that are going to be listening, you know, some of the funniest memories that you can think of at the top of your head that uh, the people don't know about. So, before you say, you know, anything crazy, you know, don't get nobody in trouble because, you know, we didn't, we didn't grow, you know, we didn't grow it up a little bit. <laughs> but, we're a little older. Yeah, yeah we're a little older. We didn't, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got a funny one, man. But so we, Devin Mitchell and I, my best friend, of course. It's always D Mitch. <laughs> it's always D Mitch. I'm always, always with D Mitch, bro. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so he was dealing with his little girlfriend at the time. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. <laughs> his girlfriend at the time. Yeah, and uh, he he was trying to trying to break up with her, but she wasn't letting it happen. <laughs> we we're fresh and we young. We kind right, of just right. living life at the time. Right. So this clown breaks up with his girlfriend. So she like snatches his shirt off of him and everything. <laughs> right. So she locks him in the room. He couldn't go nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> and he's called me. He's like, go oh, meet me at uh, I can't think of them dorms over there by what was it Lakeside? Maybe? I don't was know. it um Rose? Was it Rose? Might have been, might have been. Okay, yeah. But yeah. he's like, Cole, meet me at. He like, Cole, meet me at these apartments in like ten minutes, bro. Yeah. So I'm thinking it's an emergency. <laughs> so cut to the chase, man. I I leave Brian. I go sit out front in the dorms. Yeah. So I see D Mitch running outside the dorms. <laughs> With no clothes on. <laughs> and this clown, he says, drive, 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 drive. Oh, I yeah. Look back, he's chasing him out of the dorm. <laughs> so this clown jumps in the back of my trunk, on uh, the back of my uh, trunk, yeah. and I'm driving. I'm running stop signs and everything, and she's still chasing him. Yeah. So we driving around campus, <laughs> illusion, man. And uh, that was a crazy day. That's that's crazy. That's it's crazy. All, it was always demissed, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always demissed, man. Hey, so hey, so talk about talk about one of the memories that stood out when we went uh when we did the uh, two days ahead with the Marines with the Navy SEALs. Oh man, <laughs> <boy. laughs> bro! Oh, I can't. We was doing like military push ups. We was like rolling in the grass. Yeah. That boy D-Mill said, nah, I think I got pussy out of here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, I remember that time when uh we went from the uh song ball field, we went to the court. So when we first walked in, you know, the one the Navy SEAL dude, he was on the bike, like getting warmed up. So for the fans that we go, go be listening and watching this, man, look. So we had these different stations, and all the stations was like kind of like muscle endurance, like workouts. <laughs> So we go fail at we go fail at some point. So the one guy we had to choose, he had to do burpees. So we wanted to choose like one of the lightest guys, one of the most in shape guys. So we said we go get just we go get J Cole to do the burpees. <laughs> <laughs> so look, so we had to we had to fight this dude, bro. We had to do like body shots. We had to keep this dude occupied. We had to push him up against the wall. We had to fight him. So the only way we had to, like so we had to keep him occupied because we only had like. I think like ten errors, like ten mistakes. If he, if, if we stop fighting him, he can see everybody. He could point out the mistakes. So we had to, we had to keep him occupied. So, man, they was like, who gonna go first? <laughs> everybody said D Mitch. <laughs> everybody said D Mitch. D Mitch. Hey. So uh, they was count down, man. The dude like jumped the D Mitch, man. D Mitch flint so hard, bro. I said, man, it's gonna be a long day. <laughs> but it was crazy, hey, man, bro. That is funny. Man, we had to really fight. Hey. We had to fight these dudes, man. That's crazy. Nah, it's funny that you brought it up, bro. <laughs> I remember one time, uh, 
Demetrius was like, bro, I ain't gonna never get in the game. So you know what we're gonna start doing? I said we're gonna start doing. He said I'm gonna make him a rap before every game. Get tip ball. <laughs> so before every game, you know, be missing that rapping. Yeah. Man. Typical Atlanta miss, dude. Man. Typical Atlanta dude. Typical, <laughs> Typical Atlanta man. dude. That's my dude to the yeah. day, man. Yeah, yeah. So I know I know as far as like me and you, bro, like I be seeing like some of the stuff you you post on your Instagram story. So me and J. Cole, like we both big in the reading, we both big into like personal and spiritual development. So let the people know your top three books that you would recommend to people. Outside of your book, we go talk a little bit about that. But the top three books that, that you've read so far that you feel like people need to read. And I'm gonna get my top three. Okay. Uh the first one I would say Chop Wood, Carry Water. Mm, okay. Uh, the second one I would say, The Alchemist. The Alchemist, yep. I haven't read that yet, but that's in my count. That's in my uh, book suggestion. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. And this other one is called uh, The Go Giver. I read that one. I read. Th- I read that one like two years ago. I read that one two years ago. It's really good read. Yeah. So for me, what's your top three? For me, it would be the first one would be start with one. Well, the first one would be The Four Agreements with Don Miguel Ruiz. Good the, the second will be Start With Why with uh, Simon Sinek. And as far as the third one, if you're into business and as far as understanding how to like how to run a business, it would be the email. Because it talks, it gives a story about this this girl. Um, she's running this company, but the thing is, she's like self-employed. She's, so she don't really have like no employees. So she's so focused on like working in the business. So she get like this consultant to help her. And he's trying to show her how to as far as how to work on the business instead of in the business. But it's like a really good perspective on if you're trying to like to start a company and stuff like that. It's really, I would highly recommend that for sure. So, so as far as with you, man, I know you got a book on Amazon. I haven't, I haven't read it yet. I'm going to, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it, bro. I haven't Mm -hmm. read it yet. So, so my, my faith kept me going. Right. So yeah, that's the name of the book, man. Uh, Kind of what inspire me is kind of like how you doing coop. Right. I wanted to get my story out there somehow. Right. And try to encourage as many, as many kids as I can, man. Right. Just tell them, like, you know, growing up from the hood, seeing different things, man, going through different things, you don't have to take that path. You don't have to take that route. Right. Right. Thanks. You know, you can always go into school. You can do sports, man, but you have to stay focused. You got to put God first. Thanks. And, and grind and grind, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I just kind of kept it real. You know, I told about my parents selling drugs. Yeah. You know, not having a good influence on my life. Mm. What led me to, you know, making my decision to Alabama, making a better decision for my family. Right. The struggles I went through in college, mm-hmm. my Christianity, and just to where I am now. Mm. You know, it's a lot of things that, you know, I know for a person like me, I didn't get as a kid. Right. I didn't know how to invest in stocks and bonds. Right. I did not know, you know, for past income, you can use property. Right. You know, now I'm teaching and learning the game about how this property works. Right. Like you say, how does a business work? Right. There's different things that I can create wealth for my kids. Right. That's what other people do. You know, they buy these houses, rent these houses. So when their kids come along, it's like, all right, well, now you have three houses for yourself. Right. And if I went run out to Justin, I went run out to Coop, I went run out to Levi. And they both hand me fifteen hundred a month. Right. I'm gonna collect the five G's in my pocket for free. And that's called generational wealth that everybody talks about. And I know as far as also go. for the young people, definitely look. So I'm gonna get some games. So definitely look into mutual funds with low expense ratios. So I know as far as a lot of people, they don't really understand. If you if you're a young person that's gonna be listening to, to this, look into mutual funds. With low exp- low expense ratios because once you invest in that, the compound interest because time is on your side. So mm-hmm. once you invest in that, the compound interest and the and the dividend they pay out each quarter to you, and then all you do is reinvest those dividends and continuously put what you can each month into that mutual fund. Over time, it's not gonna happen overnight, but over time, you will look at that account and it will be it will be mind blowing. And this these are the, this is the information, this is the knowledge that. That a lot of people don't know about, but the thing is, is it's not hard. It's just you gotta stay consistent. You gotta stick to it, and that's with anything in life. And I know as far as with your book, bro, it, it's so dope that 
you being authentic, you being vulnerable, you being able to share your story. I was telling this one kid, you know, I was sharing my my story to him, and I brought like an older guy that, that walked by was going through a similar situation that he was going through. I'm not gonna really, you know, explain as far as the the ins and outs of it, but when he got up and left, the kid was like an amazing. He like, wow. And I told him, I said, man, look around. We was at we was at Lifetime um, Cafe. I was like, look around. I said, everybody has a story to tell. It's just the person who has the courage to tell their story. It, all of mm-hmm. us have been through something. All of us have had, had those thoughts as far as like, we think if we share that with somebody, we think we're crazy. We think we, you know, we think we're the only one going through those things. But nah, it's a lot of people that's going through similar things. But the thing is, we don't open up. We don't have the courage to share that. And like we was talking about as far as before we, you know, hit record or whatever. As far as me, people where they at, you got to talk about where you were, where you are now. A guy came into your life and made the change that he made. And then tell them that you're still a work in progress. Like we never arrive. It's an ongoing process. It's an ongoing journey. And the thing is, we're supposed mm-hmm. to relate to people, meet people where they are. And that was dope. Yeah, that's a good one, man. Just to kind of piggyback on that. It's uh, information is wealth, man. Right. If, you know, been out here in the West Coast, they teach these guys information at a young age that you and I don't get until we junior and senior years in college. Right. Facts. And at that point, it's kind of too late. Even after that. Even after that, bro. Even a little later than that. Even it's after crazy. that. Yeah. Like, these kids aren't better than us. It's right. the information piece. Facts. Even in life, like, you know, you you at 25, and this kid at 25, and he is collecting a million dollars a year, whatever he's doing, it's because of information. Right. Yeah. That what separates the two people, information. So that's why I've become big on reading. Look yeah. how else can you learn? Somebody else is teaching you or you reading. Right. You know, so. And then the thing is, people be telling me, they be like, man, man, Coop, you, you sound so smart, man. All that. I said, bro, it's in the books. It's in these books. You just got to take the time to invest in yourself and read these books. Like, it's people out there has, has already done where you, what you trying to do, where you trying to get to. And they put their whole entire biography into these books. And it's not going to be the generic stuff. It's going to be the ones that have actually done stuff. Like, and it's the same thing. Like, we talk True. about as far as with who. Like, do the research on these trainers. See what they did. See what the kid like, see the kids they didn't put into the league. See how many kids they didn't put into D1. And then go with those guys because they got the blueprint. It's the same thing, bro. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. But think about it, though, Coop. When we were young, we were spending our money on what? Jordans. Jordans. It's on the clothes. Yeah, thanks. Right? Instead of taking that $250. Right. Like you say, invest in mutual funds. Right. Invest in property. Invest right. in you a trainer. Invest in you a fifteen dollar book. <laughs> Facts, yeah, it's crazy. You know, like as a yeah. kid, they know that I'm like, oh, I'm finna buy every pair of J's come out. I got me a little right. stipend check from the university. Right. I get Pell Grant. I'm about to go crazy. <laughs> crazy, finna go crazy. Like, right. Like, like, like Jeff's in twenty nine hundred in two months. I said, bro, you spend your whole pair grade in two months. <laughs> it's crazy, bro. But we don't have that information. Like I, I can go back. I wish that some I would have known. Like, hey. Save this money. Invest this in a mutual fund. Yeah. Or put it away to invest in property. Right. Learn about you giving away fifteen hundred dollars a month to these people. Why not try to own eventually? Right. Exactly. Like you know, like you being a landlord to everybody else. Why not be your own landlord? Like why not put money in your pocket? Like the thing right. is, we change phones every two to three years, but we still own these people thirty seven dollars every month. Facts. We don't own these phones. We actually pay that payment off. Right. Thanks. That's why they allow you to trade phones in every year. <laughs> right. You got to think. <laughs> and when you understand like everything is a game, it's just you got to you got to understand that because at the same time, I had put a post up like a while ago, bro. I had said, I'd rather, I said, I'd rather, I don't want to be the person that look like I got it and don't got it. I'd rather be the person that got it and don't look like I got it, just look normal. I rather I rather be that person. Then I see a young kid. I see a young me that's looking for the information, that's looking for that mentor, that's looking for you know somebody to you know put their arm around them. And even though they came from somewhere that they don't have the information, they don't have the knowledge, and be able to share the information that, that I learned and went through, and not try to you know shoot them this dream and really get them the real. Feel me? I agree, man. And that's why I'm so like, you know, proud of you, bro. Just, you know, from man to man, it's 
you doing it for the youth, bro. Right. And a lot of people don't do it for the youth, man. Like you see these trainers, man, they do it for their money. Right. Like you don't have to get back. Like people trying to get to where you've been at. Right. But the fact you are doing that, man, you've been a servant of the Lord, man. And, and you got many blessings coming your way, brother. I appreciate that, man. And, and you too, bro, as far as what you're doing, man, as far as being a GA, you know, striving to be a head coach, bro. You know, like I said, definitely get around somebody that's the been at those different levels. And you know what it takes. You know what it takes to get there. Like you see NBA guys all the time. You, you played the D1 level. Like you was a top recruit coming out of high school. Like why not try to get that information from you? And I guarantee you, if a kid has that drive and he comes to you and asks questions, you'll be open and willing to give him that information. It just got to have that drive. 100%. <laughs> you got to have that drive, man. And that's yeah. one thing these young kids is missing, man. Even the kids in Arizona, they don't have that drive, man. Yeah. When you get punched in the face one, two, three times, we want to quit. Right. You can't quit, man. You can't quit. It's that's what anything, like, even with this PhD program, man, it's been kicking my butt, but I can't quit. Yeah. I can't quit, you know? And it's just, it's just where you come from, bro. That's a part of your drive. That's a part of your why. And I and I and it's the same thing for me, bro. As far as you know, my upbringing, where I came from, it's the same thing. Come from a small town like that's my drive to show kids that you don't have to only play basketball or rap. Or if that's if that's your talent, if that's something that you do, you know, with ease. But it's not your gift. That's your talent. Your gift and your talent is something completely different. And and I and mm -hmm. I really feel like a lot of us don't don't really understand that. But but as far as with your book, bro, like just say. If they want to, you know, purchase the book and, and read a little bit more about your story, about your testimony, about your message, like where can they go? Uh, the best advice is to go to Amazon and type in the title. My uh -huh. faith has kept me going. OK. And the books are probably right on up. The books are probably right up. I got you. And as far as like your social media handlers, if they want to uh, want to follow your journey and follow what you're doing, uh, share with them, share your social media handles. Uh, my Instagram is uh, FCHW05. What that stand for, bro? For faith, okay. faith, confidence, and hard work. Mm, dope, dope, dope. Yeah, and uh, my Twitter is uh, Justin Coleman05. Dope, dope. So, man, AJ Kyle, appreciate you for coming on. And for everybody that's watching this, man, make sure you guys like, comment, share. And make sure you guys hit that red button, man. Make sure you guys subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying the different episodes that, that we're putting on. And I'll see you guys on the next episode. Cool, man. I appreciate you, man. And uh, God bless, brother. Yes, sir. God bless you too, bro.